morning, good morning, good morning. I have an extra with me. Here he goes. He likes her better. Can you hear me good? Bella, can you hear me? Better? Should I raise it? How about that? How about now? Come on down! All right, kids, let's let's have a story. We got, we got a lot of them. Bella, can I sit on your lap? Okay. You kids remember our Bible verse from last week? It's John 1, verse 35. Remember the first word? It means look. Behold, that's not a joke. It's behold, the Lamb of God. Who? What, is, what does the Lamb of God do? Yes, he takes away the sin of the world. So let's put it all together. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, you guys are doing really good today. Today we're going to talk about bringing our friends and our families to church. Why is it important to bring our friends and family to church? What is it? Oh, okay. We'll come back around. Brantley? 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 Is it Brantley? Brantley? Brantley. Okay. I don't know why. Did you have one? Why is it important to bring our friends and our families to church? So they can learn about God. Yes, Rebel. Really. Jesus and God are Jesus and God the same person. Jesus is God's son. Okay, we're getting deep theological talk with the six year old, like eight, nine, ten, eleven year old. Thank you. That's a good hug. Jesus. Okay, we have the Father God. Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're three in one. It's like okay, you know, you know water. Let's let's, let's say you have a bowl of water. Okay, you have a bowl of water. If you heat it up real hot, it gets turns into steam. So the steam is still water, but it's different. And if you freeze the water, what does it become? Ice. It becomes hard like ice. But the ice is still water. It's different. Am I losing you? <laughs> yeah. So, let's go over our Bible verse one more time before we get off track. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you guys did so good today before we sing. I brought some special treats for you. I want to get you all sugared up so we don't fall asleep during service. That's right. Here you go. Bella, do you want one? You have a dollar? Okay. Fine. Okay. Oh, hey. This one for you. What's your name, sweetheart? Tamara? That's a pretty name. I like that. Oh, right. Now, you guys, you guys got to be sure to pay attention. And when I raise my arm like this during the service, you go, Amen, brother. Okay? Eden, you want me? Marilyn, can you catch this? I throw I'm just kidding. Okay, Dale, throw it to her. Good. That's not for you, Dale. <laughs> to the wrong person. Oh, I'm sorry. I was You're supposed to share. share. You gotta share. You have to share. Yeah. 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 All right, guys. Are you ready to sing songs for Jesus? Yeah. yeah. You're all excited. Let's go. Let's go sit back in your parents and we're gonna sing songs. Thank you. 
want you to pay very close attention to the to the uh, to the words because it says, "My God shall supply all my needs according to His riches and glory." He gives His angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. Church, you know it now. Some of you didn't. And then at the beginning of it, it goes, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, clap. All right? So this is an interactive little piece right here. So I want you to get that clap going, all right? Or stomp your feet or do something. I don't care what you do right there. But you got to be quick. All right, ready? Sing it like you mean it. Thank you. 
me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope.
your heart. Whatever's uh, troubling you, come and then just give it to God. Or uh, if you're more comfortable, just uh, pray where you're seeking this morning. But let's uh, let's uh, talk to God this morning. Father God, we just uh, thankful this day, Father. Thankful. We live in a country, Father, where we come in and worship freely. Father, we're thankful that we when we pray, uh, you will answer. Father, we're thankful that when we ask, uh, we will receive. Father, we're, we're, we're thankful that uh, you're, you're alive today and sitting on the throne. Father, we just lift up to you now. And Father, you know the needs of many in our, our congregation, many in our community. Father, those that are, that are hurting. Father, those physical hurting. Father, those that are hurting spiritually. Father, I pray that you will just uh, do what you do, Father. And just uh, touch them. Just uh, show yourself to them, Father, that... Uh, they might uh, want to know about you, Father. Uh, they may want to come to uh, see who you are, Father, and just come for that healing or for that, that joy and peace that comes from knowing you as a person, Lord and Savior. Father, we just ask now as, as we go into your community this week, wherever our jobs and activities take us, Father, I, Father, I pray for boldness, I pray for courage, I pray for strength. And Father, I pray for persistence as we talk about in Sunday school this morning, Father. Persistence in wanting to share the, the gospel with, with the lost persistence in wanting to just to minister to those that we come in contact with, Father, that we know are just not as fortunate as us. But Father, persistence in our prayer life, Father, that even though you know the things that are on our hearts, Father, the things that are on our minds, Father, the things that, that may weigh us down, Father, we, we know that we can trust you in all things. Father, we know that when we, when we trust you and, and give it to you, Father, we know that there's a peace that passes all understanding, Father, there's a peace that comes from just knowing that, that you're in charge and that you're in control of all things. Father, I pray now as we enter a time of worship, Father, I pray for Brother Adam. I pray that you'll hide him behind the cross. I pray that there will be conviction in his words, that they'll be yours and not his. Father, I pray that he will speak this morning something that someone here needs to hear from. Someone that may be lost. Father, the, the words that he shares will, will pierce their heart. They will not leave this place without fitting uh, those things said this day. Father, we thank you for what you're doing at the Second Baptist Church. We thank you for what you're doing in our community. Father, I pray that uh, as we go beyond these walls, beyond these doors, that you will be the light that you call us to be, that uh, people will know what's taking place down there. Father, if they will see it in us, the joy and the peace and the excitement that comes from seeing you move among your people. Father, we love you for what you've been doing. Father, we love you for what you're going to do today coming days and weeks. And for all these things, Father, we just give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray.
day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus and as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Where are the kids at? Really? Remember what behold means? Look. Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Can you imagine what a moment this must have been for John? What a moment this must have been to see Jesus walking up. And again, he says, behold, the Lamb of God. He says it in such a way that his disciples are there. And they say, okay, well, that must be the one we're following. Let's go. See, Jesus has been baptized and confirmed by the Father. Then he goes out into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted. And he succeeds in the temptations from Satan. And now Christ begins his ministry in earnest. This is the moment John has been waiting for. He says, Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Can you imagine what this must have been like for John? He endured everything he endured in the wilderness, all the bugs that he ate, all the honey he had to eat, every word he ever preached has been leading to this point. And it's not as if his earthly work has concluded, because John's still got work to do, my friends. But his introduction of the Christ and Jesus beginning his ministry in such a way in the flesh looks to be the climax of a life well lived. Behold, the Lamb of God. I pray one day we all enter the gates and say that with such a joy as John had here that we see that in the very face of Christ as we walk through and say, Behold, the Lamb of God. God. Like any good teacher, he has been preparing his disciples for this moment. John knew that they wouldn't be him, with him forever. Like any good teacher, he's been preparing his disciples for this moment and for the greater one coming. See, even as, as John preaches to the completeness of his joy later on in this gospel, he says when he's questioned and it comes closer to his time to going on to glory, John famously says, He must become greater. I must become less. He must become greater. That Christ would be greater should be the focus of all of our lives. He must become greater. I must become less and less and less and less so that only Christ may be seen in my life. Would you make Christ great in your life? Or would you allow him to pass on by? John sinks further into the background as, as God walks right in front of him. It says in verse 36, And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. This Greek verb that is translated looked at is defined as to look at in a sustained, concentrated way with special interest. John focused his attention upon Jesus walking by. He focused all of his intent, all of his focus, all of his mind was on Jesus as he walked by. Years later, Paul would write to the Colossians that he would say, Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Fix your eyes upon Jesus, my friends. Fix your gaze upon Jesus. Set your minds upon Jesus. Focus your life upon Jesus, for he is the only direction worthy of your gaze. And I fear that we say that until, until we sing songs of the sweet by and by, and we say, Jesus is the focus of my life, but do our lives reflect our focus? They sure do in John's case, don't they? In verse 36, it reads as the, the baptizer's plea to his disciples and to the people around him. In verse 36, he says, and look, he says, as Jesus walked by, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. I read this as a plea to the people around him and his, to his disciples. Say, look, 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 there he is. There's my God. There's my God. There he goes. That's my God. That's mine. He saved me. That's my God. That's the one I've been pointing to. That's the one I've been talking about. There's my Savior. If you would only see him as I see him, he would change the way you live. There's my God. Look upon him and mourn for your sin so he will forgive your trespasses. That's what my God can do. 
What can your God do? Oh boy, it speaks to John's commitment to the mission that he would so desperately point the people around him to Jesus. It's not about Adam. It's not about John. It's not about Renee. It's not about uh, Tam. It's about Jesus. How do we point ourselves to Jesus? It's not even about Second Baptist Church on Moby. It's about Jesus. And Jesus again, and Jesus again. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said, if you are to preach, preach Christ. And then preach Christ. And then preach Christ. And if all else fails, you know what you preach? Christ. Christ. Christ should be the focus and the centerpiece of our lives. Would you sacrifice your own ministry for the betterment of the kingdom of heaven? Would we sacrifice who we are for the betterment of the kingdom of heaven? Would I sacrifice my, my well-being and my time and my concern and my, my money? Would I sacrifice that for Jesus? A mega church, you know, the big churches... A mega church is defined as averaging 2,000 attendees per week. Now, we're not quite there, but we're getting it. we got a couple more rows to fill. Dale needs a friend up here if anybody wants to sit there. 2,000 attendees per week. The National Congregation Study found that half of all churchgoers in America attend 9% of the churches. Think about that. Half of everybody that goes to church today will attend 9% of the churches in America. One pastor who, who leads a church of 8,000 people said the reality is that we as mega churches don't do discipleship well. And it's because of the time and the energy on the big event every weekend. 8,000 people is a lot to give personal attention to. He goes on to say that pastors like himself, they must begin to ask themselves, do we just have a lot of people coming? Or are we truly making disciples? Are we packing the pews or are we making disciples? See, John wasn't interested in just packing the pews, was he? He wasn't interested in just bringing the crowds and bringing everybody to John so he could say, look what John did. I think if John wanted to, he very well could have. He could have preached to thousands. But that's not the focus of John's life. See, now, I'm not calling for an immediate take down of the megachurch model. And so don't get it twisted if, if Mr. Osteen, if you're watching this, that's not what I'm... And you probably need to listen a little closer, but that's not what we're talking about. I'm not calling for immediate takedown, or even that everything about a megachurch is bad. Because it's, it, it's not. You get that many people, you have a lot of resources to pull with, you can reach more people. Because that, that's not the case that everything about them is bad. Here's what I'm saying, though. If you look at the biblical model for building churches, the biblical model set forth in Acts, the biblical model set forth by John the Baptizer here, I just don't believe that a church of 10,000 congregants was the plan. Are we making disciples or are we filling pews? We must make disciples of all people, of every nation. He says, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He's going to send us everywhere to make disciples. Are we making disciples or just trying to pack a man so I can get on Facebook and say, look how many people we had at church today. No. The key to discipleship here is building relationships, not only, to, not, not only with each other and investing in each other's lives and encourage our church members while we're here, which should absolutely happen. Before you leave today, find someone to encourage. We are building disciples. We are building a, an aura of discipleship in this church. And that takes an investment of the, in the people's lives around you, next to you, behind you, in the parking lot, in the chili cook-off. We must invest in each other's lives. But it's not just about that. It's not just about building relationships with each other. It is encouraging our church family to a stronger relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Do we push our people closer to Jesus or do we push them to ourselves so I can say, look how many friends I have at church. Look at this small group that I'm leading. Look at this. Look. If anything that we do in the church ends with, look what I did, we're not doing it the right way. Are we pointing people to Jesus? Author Gerald Orche wrote, to minimize oneself in order for Jesus to become the focus of attention is the designated function of an ideal witness. It should be the, the centerpiece of our lives to focus ourselves on Jesus and to push people to Jesus. I had a, I had a time at the church I come from before at Hazeldale, and there was a period for about a year there where we had four pretty solid dudes. And Brother Lee Witt, my brother-in-law Brandon, who was just ordained, uh, my friend Brendan Griffith, who some of you may know, I think he's preached at a walk party, and myself. And for about a year there, we had four, not to toot our horns, because that, that's not what this is, but four good, godly, strong men helping to lead the church. And that was a great year, but you couldn't help when we would go out to lunch and we would look around the table and think, this is a, man, this is great, but it's not going to last forever. God is sending these men somewhere. And now Brother Brendan is the youth pastor in Chickasha. And the Lord sent me here, and Brandon and, and Lee are, are leading Hazelville. Well, Lee's in the Bahamas right now, so. You know. he, and he didn't take his mother with him. I'm sorry, Shirley. I'll talk to you. Some kids just aren't appreciative of their mothers, are they? <laughs> we can't get so comfortable that we tell them God we never want to leave. If we're bursting at the seams here at this church, we got 500 people every Sunday. And you got that's great. People are going to take notice. But at that point, it's time for some of y'all to split up and plant churches and build disciples, not just pack the pews. Are we packing the pews with disciples or just people? And you move on to verses 38 and 39 here. It says, And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. I'm going to give you, for, for the rest of our time here, I'll give you two reasons why discipleship within a church body is important. Two reasons. Reason number one, your destination depends on it. Your destination depends on it. John's disciples heard this message about Jesus, and suddenly there was no time to waste. They heard about Jesus. They knew what John said about Jesus. They knew and they trusted the words of John. And if he said this about Jesus, well, that must be somebody I have to follow. There was no time to waste. They left their teacher and they followed Jesus. Bible scholar Adam Clark said of this passage, Happy are they who, on hearing of the salvation of Christ, immediately attach themselves to its author. Lose not another moment. Eternity is at hand and thou art not prepared to meet thy God. Are you prepared to meet thy God today? Or would we attach ourselves to the author and finisher of our faith, to the author of our salvation? Would you attach yourselves to Jesus Christ today or would you allow him to pass on by? And Christ says, what are you seeking? He, he turns and he sees the man saying, what, what are you looking for? What are you seeking? These are the first recorded words of John of Jesus in John's gospel, and they cut straight to the heart, don't they? He turns and he sees them and he says, What are you looking for? Oh, right there. Sometimes we just need a direct approach, don't we? Sometimes we need people in our life to just stop beating around the bush and get to it. A more direct approach is absolutely necessary sometimes. And that's what Jesus has here. What are you looking for? Do you get in or get out? It's not big around the bush. The Greek word for seeking is defined as to look by inquiring. To investigate, to reach a binding resolution. 
So there, he says, what are you, what are you investigating? What are, what, what are the answers that you're looking for? What are you trying to do with your life? What, just, what, what is it that you're looking for? And I fear that many people in this world today who would attempt to stand in the shadow of Almighty God would never be confronted with the question of, what are you looking for? Would we try to follow Jesus from a distance and stand in the shadow of God, but never really follow Him and say and answer the question, what are you looking for? What do you want with your life? What do you what is the answers that you're seeking for your life and with Jesus? Are you looking for Jesus? Are you just trying to follow from a distance so people might see you and think, oh, well, they must be with Jesus. They're probably pretty good people. Do we enter into his house seeking the heart of God? Peering into his holiness through his word. Do you enter into his word seeking the heart of God every day? Every moment of your being should be in peering to Christ. What am I looking for? He's right there. Anybody asking, what do you want with your life? He's right there. What are you doing with your life? He's right there. We saw a show called The Chosen, and uh, there, there was the actor who plays Matthew was having some trouble with with his day to day life, and he said, "Really, it's boiled down to one thing. And when I wake up in the morning, I answer the question, or when I wake up in the morning, here's what I know I have to do: I have to follow him, and everything else take care of, takes care of itself." So must we answer the question, what are you seeking? If that answer to the question is, I have to follow him. It may be hard. You good? Okay. It may be hard. Am I saying everything in your life is going to be resolved right off the bat? Is your life going to be tough? Yes. Are you going to have to make tough decisions? Yes. Christ came to bring a sword and divide families and divide crowds and divide the world. That's what it will take. But do we enter into this house with the, seeking the heart of God with one destination and one goal? All I have to do while I'm here is follow Him. What does His Word say about my life? What does His Word say about my family? What does His Word say about my church? Psalm 34 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, would you taste and see that the Lord is good. God said to the prophet Isaiah, He says, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Let me tell you why it's so important to be in church here. You will be hard-pressed to taste and see that the Lord is good should you decide to forsake the assembly of believers. Amen. How are you going to see that the Lord is good? You're going to taste what He has for you if you're trying to do it all by yourself. I've told this story a couple times of a man at the senior center where I worked in Shawnee. I said, well, Bill, how come you don't come to church with us? And he said, well, Adam, I'll tell you what. I can go outside to that tree there in the back alley, back alley and I can be just as spiritual by that tree as I could in the church. Mm. You know I'm on the clock, Bill, but you better get yourself straightened out. You're not going to like the answer someday. You will be hard-pressed to taste and see that the Lord is good should you decide to try to do it alone. Hebrews chapter 10 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another to love and good works. Let's encourage one another while we're here. Let's act happy to be here. Let's say, hey, it's good to see you. Because we don't know how hard it was for some people to walk through those doors. We had a testimony of a young lady this, this Wednesday. And she said, you don't know how hard it is for some people to walk through those doors. Act like you're happy to see them. Amen. Let's, be, let's, be, let's encourage people in the name of God. Let's... A lot of people are scared when they come to church. 
and they don't need some big counseling session. They don't need to go to the pastor's office and cry their eyes out. What they need is someone to sit with them and someone to say, hey, hi, how you doing? My name's Adam. My name's Rachel. My name's Elizabeth. I'm glad you're here. That's all it takes. Are we willing to step out in faith? Now, you know, let, me, let me be clear. That's hard. That's a lot harder for some of us than it is for others. Just walk up to strangers. Amen? Look at the, the picture of my marriage. It's a lot easier for me to walk up to strangers than it is my, my, my poor sweet wife. If they're four years old, yeah, she can do it all day. If they're any older than that, mm -hmm. Discipleship and encouragement happen around like-minded people. That's why you can't do this alone. Because you need to be disciples and you need to be encouraged. And you cannot encourage yourself if you are not with the Lord. Discipleship and encouragement happen around the people who are attaining or are striving towards the same goal as us. It's not hiding away in your house trying to make up every excuse in the book. Oh, well, I, I'm tired, or, or I'm just not feeling it, or I have family coming in, or, or church just isn't for me, or I'm grieving, or I don't want to come along. Somebody stop me when I strike a nerve. Anybody? Are we trying to make up every excuse in the book not to join the family of God and assemble as the believers of the faith? Or are we just trying to make excuses for why we have a reason not to be there? Because sometimes maybe the pastor hears those excuses on Sunday and then he sees you out around town the next day. I'm not throwing anybody out there. You're not getting any names from me. I, I value my job. We got bills to pay. It's okay, Amy. I'm not doing that. She had the look of fear in her eyes. And, no, I don't want to pay these bills by myself. Now, am I trying to guilt shame people into perfect attendance, perfect attendance at church? Is that what I'm No, that's not what I'm doing. That's not at all what I'm trying to do is to guilt you into feeling shame for not being here on one Sunday or another. But what I'm telling you is that you will never, ever find Jesus if you're only pretending to look for him. And I think we have to ask ourselves when, when God says to us, what are you looking for? We have to honestly answer that in our heart. Am I only pretending to look for Jesus? Or do I honestly, earnestly seek Him with everything that I am? You know the, the state of the church and why so many people are leaving the church. The church is in droves. Churches are shutting down by the thousands each year. Are we pretending to look for Jesus? Or are we honestly seeking the heart of God and what He wants for our lives? Do you keep asking yourself, where is God? Where is God? What are you doing, God? Why is this happening? And He answers in five simple words in verse 39. What are you doing, God? Why are you doing this? Why are you making life so hard? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Where are you, God? And He says in five words in verse 39. Come and you will see. Somebody come on. Come and you will see. I promised you last week I wouldn't sing again. But I lied. And you have to deal with it now. If you're a visitor, I'm sorry. I said you're doing this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Come and you will see. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. We go on to verse 40 here. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. We have found him, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas. Cephas, which means Peter. Reason number two why it's important for to be a church for discipleship. 
your family depends on it. Your destination depends on it, and your family depends on it. Andrew, Simon, Pre Simon Peter's brother, look what it says in verse, 30, in verse 40. He first found his own brother. He ran to Jesus, and he said, look, we have found the Messiah. It's time to go. It's time to go. Like a kid in a Chuck E. Cheese trying to, like, come on, Mom. Come on, Mom. It's time to go. Let's go. Let's go. It's, it's, we, we found him. He's in there. Chuck E. Cheese is in there. We have found the Messiah. From the moment sin was introduced into the world, the family has been, the family unit has been under attack. Amen. Our families are under attack, and the armies of hell would unleash their full force against our families because if you can take down the family, the rest will fall. Your families depend on it. All you mothers and all you fathers, your families are depending on you. All you wives and all your husbands and all you husbands. We can list statistics all day about family involvement in church. I can listen to we're blue in the face. Almost 50%, almost married couples are 50% less likely to divorce if attending church regularly. Father's Day is the least attended holiday of the year at churches across this country. 86% of church attendees are there at the invitation of a friend or a relative. 86%. These are real statistics from Harvard and fancy places like that in life way. And then we don't even need to use statistics. We can use the Bible. What does Proverbs 22, 6 say? Train a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Are we raising our children in God's house? Or are we letting them go whichever way they want to go? Like the old Andy Griffith show where he's, the, the hobo's there. And he, said, he tells Andy Griffith, well, you should let that kid make the decision for himself. And Andy Griffith says, no. He's a kid. He's going to chase any first shiny thing he sees. It is our job to raise our children in God's house. Amen. Are we doing so? So to all the moms and the dads and the grandmas and the grandmas and the meemaws and the pop pops and the grannies and the pop pops, get yourself to church. Or your excuses will become the example for your family. Will you allow your excuses to become the example? Or will you raise your family in church and do as God has told us to do? Get your family to church. Their lives depend on it. It's not just if you want to go. We can't make people go. We're not going to drive them in here to chain and ball, but... Get your family to church. If they are in your house, they better be in church. But the reality is that there are countless people across this nation and even across this town who, who don't have a strong godly influence in the church once they leave the, the doors of this church. Once they leave the doors of the church, they don't have a strong influence, a strong Godly influence at home. A lot of people don't have both mom and dad. A lot of the kids here, they, they, they don't have somebody to make them go to church. There are a lot of broken homes in this nation. There are a lot of broken homes in this town. It is up to us as the body of believers to fill the void. Amen. It is up to us to be a father to the fatherless, to be a mother to the motherless, to be a sister or a brother to those that don't have a family. It is up to us to be a sister or a brother or a mother or a father or even maybe a grandkid. Some of you younger folks, sometimes grandmas just want somebody to love them. Any of us can just let somebody love on us. It is up to us, though, as a body of believers to fill the void, just the same as Andrew when he goes to find his brother Simon. And the moment Andrew encounters Jesus,
Jesus, nothing else matters. That seems to be a theme in this book, doesn't it? Nothing else matters once Jesus gets here. We have found the Messiah. He is here. Let's go, Simon. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Are we living with such an urgency in our lives that when we have found the Messiah, we will do anything we can to get our families and our friends and our school and our teachers? Are we doing everything we can to get them here? You cannot follow Jesus passively. You are either in or you are out. You are either trying to get people in the doors or you are not. Imagine Andrew excitedly trying to hurry John up or hurry Simon up to get back to Jesus. Urging and pushing and pushing and pushing. Maybe pulling his arm as Simon kind of brushes him off and says, hey, would you stop touching me like that? Personal space, Aunt Simon, or Andrew. I don't want, like, just, I'll get there when I get there. And Simon, Andrew goes, no, 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 no. We gotta go. We gotta go. We have found the Messiah. What kind of witness are you to your family? Answer that amongst yourselves. What kind of witness am I to my family? Am I desperately trying to get my family to Jesus? Or am I letting it pass on by? Like we discussed Wednesday, you cannot properly and correctly love anyone outside of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is impossible to love anyone the right way outside of Jesus. We cannot say that we love our families and sit idly by as they pass their days separated from Jesus and his church. We can't do it. It is impossible to say that we love our families and let them just go on with the bad selves, doing whatever they want to do. We say our, if we say we love our families and we sit idly by just watching them pass their lives away separated from Jesus and separated from his church, you know what we're doing. We are loving them all the way to hell. I don't want to love my family all the way to hell. I love my family. I want them to be in glory someday. And I would say whatever we needed to say to them to get them to glory someday. Finally, Andrew... He gets his brother to Jesus. He finally gets him there and he pulls Andrew up to Jesus and says, Look, I told you, it's the Messiah right there. I wasn't lying to you. There's a reason we are in such a hurry. It's important to remember that old phrase, though, when we witness to people. Because we can try desperately all we want to get people to Jesus, but we have to remember you can lead a horse to water, but you can't take a drink. Maybe there are a lot of horses that come to church not day after day, a week after week after week after week. They're coming to the well, but they're never drinking. You can lead all the horses you want here, but you cannot make them drink. But Simon, he finally gets to Jesus, and Andrew's like, okay, look, there he is. And Andrew follows the model of John, and as he introduces Simon to Jesus, he, Andrew kind of... It's time to take a step back. I have done my job. I have introduced my family to Jesus. And Jesus looks at him. He looks at Simon intently. He looked into who he was and knew everything about him. He looks at Simon, who used to be. He looks at some, who Simon used to be. And he knew what Simon would become if Simon would place his faith in him. In Jesus' acknowledgement of Simon, I think what I feel like we're hearing when he says, you are Simon. Here's what I hear when he says that you're a loud mouth. You're irrational. Sometimes you don't listen good, and sometimes you just hear what you want to hear. You don't listen, you don't behave, you're irrational, and you will deny me on the... Three times on the most crucial night of my ministry, Jesus knows all of this as Peter walks up. And yet he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. I don't care who you used to be, Simon. I don't care what you're going to do to me, Simon. I love you anyways because you are mine. You belong to me. My grace is sufficient for you. I can make all things new. And he says, Simon, the son of John, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Through Peter's faith, he 
in Jesus, the giver, the faith in Jesus as the giver of salvation, Peter will become the rock upon which Christ builds his church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Should we turn to Christ? Should we come in those doors each week seeking the heart of God? He will build his church through us and the gates of hell will never win against us. What are you seeking? What are you looking for? As the worship team comes up, I'll ask you a couple more times. What are you looking for? Are you just are you just trying to get by and look good doing it? Is that what I'm looking for? When I wake up and I ask myself, what am I looking for? Okay, maybe I'll go to church and uh, people will see me there and they'll say, hey, it's good to see you. But I don't actually have to look for Jesus. I can just come sit and say amen sometimes and be out the doors. What am I looking for? Am I looking for... Jesus. See, maybe you found Jesus, and he has changed you from the inside out like he did with Simon Peter. Maybe he has changed you, but you still have family that's out there and they're lost. Anybody got a lost family member in here? See, whatever it may be, today is the day to invite Jesus into our church. Whatever it may be, today is the day to invite Jesus into your family. Today is the day to invite Jesus into your life. Ask yourselves again, what are you seeking? I invite you today to come and see me. In a moment, they're going to sing a song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. So when you ask yourself, what am I seeking? Or you feel Christ pulling on your heartstrings right now saying, what are you looking for? What do you want to do with your life? What are you doing going forward? How, how, are you, how are you going to build the kingdom? What are you seeking? I invite you to stand and sing this song that says, I want to turn my eyes upon Jesus. I want to turn my eyes upon Jesus. So that when I wake up every day from here on out to the rest of my days till I go into glory, I know I have one responsibility. To follow him and everything else will work out. Am I seeking Jesus earnestly and honestly? Or am I just trying to look at him? Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you for the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And I pray for every person in this room as we have, may have family who are lost or as we may ourselves be lost. I pray that you pull the heartstrings and you use your Holy Spirit to come over this room and rain down like fire in the lives of every person here. So that, that they may be awakened to your Spirit and awakened to the power of who you are and what you can do. And as I pray these things, I pray that we all may have the courage to be honest enough with ourselves and with you, God, and to answer the question, what am I seeking? What am I looking for? That I would turn my eyes upon Jesus should be the sole goal of my life. And it is in all these things we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.